Three, two, one, we are live. Welcome back to Mapping It Out with me, Coda, and Ryan Williams. Today, it's episode 29. Um, I just want to do something a little different. We got busy during the week, so we we couldn't film an episode, but we still had to make an episode. You know, you can't just skip a week. So this week, episode 29, what we're doing is the best of moments and things that Ryan said, I said, that were just like fire things that um, over the t- last 28 episodes, it's just things to come back to. I think it's great to uh, just kind of take those spark notes of an idea, kind of run with it. Hope you enjoy episode 29. Uh, we'll be back next week, episode 30, going strong. Appreciate all you guys and let's get into it. Because you did with Mike, you did with Disney, like you still mm-hmm. do with Disney where it's like, She's CEO. She'll make a call. Yeah. And then it's like, no, babe, like I'm I'm the founder. Like this is what we got to do. Like, and it's mm-hmm. kind of, you guys kind of go at it. Right. But it's like, maybe explain that too. Cause well, tec- that's another so thing. So technically this. I'm the president and founder, mm-hmm. which is on paper underneath the CEO. Okay. Yeah. But I'm also the owner, which is above the CEO. Uh-huh. So when I'm telling her what to do, it's not as a president founder thing. It's as the owner, like, Hey, this is what I say needs to happen. Because I'm the owner. Yeah. And so the owner is above the CEO, um, but I'm 100% owner of that company. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, Disney's my wife, so technically it's like, you know, 50 50. Exactly. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh, technically, on paper, that's the way it's structured. But I, I try not to have those dictator style conversations because there's very few times where I've had to do that uh, because Disney's really good. She has really good arguments for why she believes what she believes and wants to do what she wants to do. But there's only a few times where I have to be like, look, like this is a long-term vision. I, I know in the short term, what you're saying is correct and right, but we're going this fucking way. We're going this direction this is what we have to do. But if it were like 50-50, yeah, who gets to make that call? You know, And that's why I think it's so important to outline in the beginning those those overlapping responsibilities. You can have a conversation about it, but at the end of the day, somebody's got to be able to make that call. Like, hey, we're doing this. And the other person's got to be like, hey, I don't agree with that, but we're in the same boat. We're going, I know we want the same things long-term, so I'm going to go with it. Because if you just fight about everything, like, dude, it's you're not going to go anywhere. And that's no fun. <laughs> that, yeah, that sucks. Dude, I know. In the beginning, a lot of people do dropship where you don't have no no inventory and you have print on demand model and you just basically you're a marketer and you're just marketing ideas on t-shirts and that's totally viable. Uh, but let's say in this guy's case, it sounds like he's currently running his own system. It sounds like he's got a shop he's working with and he's getting product into his you know spare room or garage or whatever and he's looking at how to actually get it out to the customer. I think he said that he's... He goes to the post office. Okay, so yeah. like grabs off the shelf in the garage, goes to the post office, post office and sends it out. Yeah, a couple, couple key things Key things on that. It's super easy. Um, first off, you should be using Shopify as your e-commerce platform. Um, Ari Witt at Digital Nomad Designs is who we go through for all our stuff. Our email is Ari, A-R-I, at digitalnomaddesigns.com. Hit her up. She's not paying. Like we don't. <laughs> she just does awesome work, yeah. and I wanted to grow. And she's a badass person. So I'm like, dude, go to her for anything Shopify needed. The back end that we use, Shopify is really good on the front end, but it's kind of clunky to fulfill off of. So we recommend using uh, ShipStation.com, which is a plugin that's like. I don't know, 10 to 20 bucks a month on the back end. You run all your fulfillment off that. Shopify is your front end. ShipStation.com is your back end. You can batch process stuff out and just make it way faster. And then when you print off the labels, uh, so you have a packing slip and and a shipping label. What people normally do is they have a regular printer, which prints out paper. Ink is stupid expensive. Yeah, Uh, That's where the print companies make all their money is the inks. It's nuts. So, which the best option is to get a uh, a thermal printer. Uh, Dymo 4XL is good. I think we use now a Rolo or something or other. Don't ask me on fucking internet. You, you're asking Google this shit. <laughs> you're getting enough free information. About the the thermal printer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thermal printer. Yeah. Uh, Dymo 4XL is, is the one we used to use and we use a Rolo now. But that's going to save you on ink costs because you don't have any ink costs. And I think you can get UPS labels for free on Amazon or something like that. But they're mm-hmm. four by six labels. Super easy and that'll save you a lot of money. Um, and they're fast and like, Relatively simple too. Poly manners, you can get on Uline. We use, I think, the 11 by 13 inch. You just get them on Uline for, I don't know, 20 cents, 40 cents. You can get customized stuff. Sticker Mule is great. I don't know if they have that. PSprint.com has some stuff with there. I mean, th- those are the places we literally get our stuff from. Yeah, you just got to take it down to USPS until you're big enough where you can establish a drop, which means like they'll come and pick up from your house. You know, that's the point where you have a, a warehouse type mm-hmm. thing. Um, but to save time, just don't ship every day. Just do it like Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So instead of like, you'll batch out your time. So instead of spending a half hour every day for five days, like just spend 45 minutes Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So now you're making three trips to the office a week instead of five and your customers get it 
you know, a half a day earlier or later, typically not something the average customer is going to complain about. That's exactly the blueprint that I would recommend for somebody starting an apparel brand. You, you got to leave room for the universe to work. And I've honestly noticed sometimes like I'll push super fucking hard to get something because I think I want it. I think it's, you know, good to where I want to go. And then and I've, I've learned to pay attention to the universe telling me signs because when I don't pay attention, I'm like, no, I fucking want this. I want this. I want this. And you push hard enough, you fucking get it. But then very shortly afterwards, you realize, oh, fuck, this is not a good idea. I see now why all these obstacles were thrown in my way of like to get this, to get this, to get this. It was actually a bad fucking idea. And so many times uh, now that I see the patterns, I'm able to recognize them earlier. And there's more than three things that get thrown in my way of like obstacles. I'm like, you know what? Hey, it's not the right time. So like a specific example, we're supposed to move into that bigger uh, 17,000 square foot uh, warehouse space. And we were made the offer and counter offer, counter offered like all the shit and got to like, it was a fifth thing. And they're asking for like a, a small thing, like a personal guarantee on it. I'm like, I'm one with my business. All my shit is personally guaranteed anyway. So I don't really, that's not a big thing. But the fact that it was the fifth thing, like the fifth pushback. I was like, okay, it's not, that's not the thing. That's the universe telling me I need to step back and take a take another look at it. And then once we took another look at it, we realized that it wasn't the right move. And I'm so glad we pulled back and we're like, no, we're, we're not going to expand to this other thing and grow, grow, grow. We're going to focus on building out where we're currently at and changing out uh, some of the parameters we had internally. And dude, that was 1000% the right call. Mm -hmm. And I was so gung-ho on that place. I'm like, dude, this is fucking awesome. It's going to be the shit. I posted about it. And then it was that one little thing, that one little universe like tapping on the shoulder, like, hey, final warning. <laughs> you sure you want to do this? But thank God I fucking learned enough. I got smacked in the face enough now that I'm able to hear it and listen. I wanted to go buy a kettlebell with faces on it, like a skull kettlebell. I thought they existed. So I was Googling it. And I couldn't find one. I'm like, pretty cool idea. Nobody's doing it. I can't be the only one that wants this. Like maybe there's an opportunity here. So I found a local sculptor. I gave him a sketch basically. He's like, okay, cool. Like we'll make this. There was this one place that made them in San Diego, just the prototypes. And I was like, cool. They look good. Like let's go to production. And they're like, no. We don't want to produce any of these things. Shit, man, what am I going to do? And my buddy James, and he's like, dude, I got this guy in China that I can connect you with that might be able to do them. So I talked to this guy in China. I'm like, well, I had no experience with overseas manufacturing at all. My house is going to foreclosure. This is like 2008 or nine. I'd spent all my money trying to keep my house afloat when I should have just like, <laughs> just let it go. The reason I say that is because the financial situation I was in, I had less than zero I was actually $20,000 in credit card debt because all my cash is going to try to pay off the house. And so I was basically living on credit cards. The guy I got in contact with in China, he's like, okay, it's going to be the minimum order is, you know, basically what it equated to around $60,000. But I was like, okay, let's do this. So I had a manufacturer lined up and I had the website, I had the name, had the whole like business set. I still had no fucking money. So I was like, look, it's going to be a three month lead time on this. So I was like, okay, I'm going to get the resin casts. Those took photos in my garage. I put them up on the website. It's going to be a three-month pre-order. Because it was such a new idea, it was first to market. We ended up selling a lot, but that was a huge gamble for me because I'm like, okay, I had a $60,000 PO to even start this, negative $20,000 in my bank account. If this doesn't work, I don't know what the fuck I'm going to do. Thankfully, that part of it worked where we got enough interest and in, in, uh, income coming in from the pre-orders that it covered, I think, like forty dollars or $50,000 of the, of the pre-order. And so they finally come in three months later. I remember hopping up in the, uh, in the truck and I pull one out. Fuck yes. I'm going to be rich. This is awesome. And I pull open another one and it looks like total shit. It was like unsellable. And it turns out that about 33% of them, like a third of them were, they were good. And around a third of them were just complete shit. And we just put them straight in the recycling bin. And there's about a third that was in the middle where they were fixable. Like, But then I realized, okay, if I powder coat them back again, I am losing money on it no matter how I sell it. So my solution was, I'm like, I, I wonder if this is going to work. I took a wire wheel and I ground the powder coat off and then I hand filed all the little burrs on it. It just looked beautiful. We ended up uh, uh, selling those for like three times the cost. Uh, that's how I made my money back on it. And because they were so new and they looked so different, so cool, we were able to get like, you know, a huge price increase for them. And that's what helped us like cover the cost for everything. That was probably the biggest like tight butthole moment <laughs> in entrepreneurship to that Jeez point. Louise. Where I'm like, dude, pulling the trigger on that, like committing to a $60,000 PO when you have not even $0, like negative negative $20,000. I was like, fuck, dude, I don't know what I'm going to do if this doesn't work, but I gotta fucking try.
maybe this is the most important book. If you're if you're looking at starting a company or starting a business or, or working for yourself or just kind of want to take more control of your life and like a, like a side hustle, it's it's kind of a dated book now, but it's called The 4-Hour Workweek by uh, Tim Ferriss. His podcast is amazing, by the way. I learned so much from his podcast. That book really kind of helped me figure out how to look at the outcome of what I wanted and then work backwards from the outcome. So he's talking about like, you know, getting an Audi R8 at the time. He's talking about, okay, how much money do I need to make per month to do that? Okay, that's how much money per day. What kind of business do I need to create to, you know, make $50, $80 a day to put towards this? And then, so you can kind of look at the goal first, chop everything up and break it down to the, the basics of, okay, I have 24 hours in a day. I can put, you know, eight, nine hours into my main job, my my actual income. And then I can put four hours into my side hustle or two hours or whatever it is. But it's, it's, it really taught me to look at situations and, and structure in an outcome based mentality rather than just like, I just need to work. I need to work. I need to work. Look, well, okay. For what? Like, what are you going for? What's the outcome you're, you're looking for? Um, and, uh, I think that was maybe like 2012, I think. But still, I think a really, really useful book for somebody who doesn't really know where to start or what to do. And they're kind of like, I want to do this. I want to do all these things, but I don't know the first, like, what's the first thing I need to do? Honestly, that's probably the best book I would read for that. It's for our work week, Tim, Tim Ferriss. Being young, right? Mm -hmm. Then going into the SEALs, did the SEAL teams change you? Or that's kind of how you always been as a person? It kind of just heightened things. You know what I mean? The reason that I went in the Navy specifically to be a SEAL was it was the hardest thing I could think of to do at the time. It was either that or climb Everest, and I didn't have 50 grand to climb Everest. But the reason I wanted to do it is because I wanted to find out who I was and where I where I fit on this on this scale of like who am I as a man, as a person, as a human, as a contributor to the to the world, where do I fit? So it was way easier, I thought, <laughs> to just start at the hardest thing. And if I if I don't make it, I'll go down a notch. If I don't make that, I'll go down a notch. I never went there like, I'm going to make it. I'm going to do this. I'm going to die. All this shit. I, I, was, I was not that guy. I was like, look, I'm going to train my ass off. I'm going to push myself really hard. And I'm going to go into training and hope that what I'm willing to give to the program is more than what the program is going to ask of me. And a little bit of luck and we'll make it through. And thankfully, that's how it worked out. But it is important to do something hard, I think, when you're younger. Um, the point of that is that it's that chicken and egg thing. Like, which came first? The mentality yeah. to, did you have the mentality to become a SEAL or did going through training give you that mentality? Mm -hmm. And I think my personal opinion on it is that most people who make it through training already have a propensity or a type of personality that lends itself to being able to go through hard shit, which honestly is very similar mentality to entrepreneurship. And that's why most of my friends now are not team guys. Like I hang out with a very small handful of actual team guys. Most of my friends now are other entrepreneurs because it's the same mindset, like almost identical mindset. Um, but the difference is a lot of team guys, what they'll do is they'll go through training, they'll do one hard thing in their life and then they slack off and they stop working out and they get fat and they just like, they, they turn into fucking Uncle Rico's dude. And they're like, I oh, used to do this, used to do that. Like, dude, nobody gives a fuck. I was like, I went through buds and 98. I mean, that was what, 24 years ago? It doesn't fucking matter at all in my day to day life. But these people are like, yo, remember back in my day? Remember we did this? I'm like, dude, we're talking about high school stories, bro. What the fuck? We're talking about bud stories, 40. Like, I don't want to fucking do that. Whereas entrepreneurs have to go through shit, but there's an understanding that you constantly have to get better and progress and learn because if you don't, you're going to get eaten up. So it's not like one hard thing that you go through entrepreneurship is a series of hard things. And it's it's like going to the gym. Like the weights don't get lighter, you just get stronger. Mm -hmm. And you just get better and you keep working and eventually you become the type of person that can run a, you know, a really big company. But I think it starts with that mindset of just like, hey, like, like you said, like, I don't know if I can do it, but I'm gonna go try it out and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, it's, that's the key, I think. That's the common denominator in the mentality between entrepreneurs and Navy SEALs is just the willingness, willingness to bet on yourself and go try and do hard shit and see if you can do it. Yeah. So there's really only three ways to grow revenue in a company or a, a typical company, aside from like publicly traded and all the other stuff. But typically there's only three ways. Number one, you got to get more customers or you sell the same people more stuff yeah. or you raise your prices. 
those are only like really the only three ways. So if we've already established that it's basically break even to get new customers, it's yeah, expensive. Right now, yeah. If you've already raised your prices to a reasonable amount, and and on that, most of you guys are selling t-shirts. Like everybody knows inflation, everybody knows the supply chain problems. If you're selling a t-shirt for twenty two, twenty five dollars, you're not even in the fucking game. Like if you've been doing that, raise it to twenty five, twenty eight. If you've been at twenty eight, raise it to thirty two, maybe thirty five is a quality product. There's a, an expectation from your consumer to quality. Right. So they know that they expect to pay $30, $35 for a t shirt anymore. You know, five years ago, like, oh my God, that's stupid expensive. We can never do that. So if you guys are listening and you're, and you're trying to figure out how to price your product as an apparel, raise it at least $5 and see what that, see what that hits. Um, but then, so the third thing is sell the same people more products. And that's what I was getting out with, um, my buddy that, that runs that line and, uh, they're doing good, but they haven't had any new products. I'm like, you have all these people that love your brand, give them more stuff. Do a new design every month, you know, and then you'll have some that hit and some that don't. And the ones that hit, awesome. Now make it an evergreen product and keep it always in stock and have a new one next month. If that one flops, no problem. Yeah. Sell it out, <laughs> run a sale on it, and then develop a new design. So over a year, you've got 12 designs. Three or four of them will probably be hitters. And now you've got three or four solid, like evergreen products that when new people come to your site, now they've got stuff like, oh, fuck, I love all this shit, you know? So they're more, even more invested and in, in integrated into your company and your brand. Of course, when you start a business, it's going to take you a shit ton of time. Can you elaborate what you mean more of the time span of for this, three months? You know, it's, like, it's going to take you probably five to 10 times longer than you think it is. Yeah. Yeah. Because I talked to, we've talked to so many brands that are just starting up and like, awesome, we're going to sell all this stuff. And, you know, we're going to be driving Lamborghinis in six months. I'm like, well, ah, uh, <laughs> like, like six years. <laughs> like, come on. Um, so I think just having a realistic assessment of of what it might take, and and that's maybe a good rule here is say it takes ten times longer than what you think it's going to take. Like so you take you think it's going to take six months, and actually takes say five years, right? Are you willing to commit the next five years to bringing this idea to the point where you think it's going to be in six months? What if it takes ten times longer? Are you still willing to stick it out? What if you get five times down that and you're like, fuck, I got to double this. I got to spend another two and a half years doing this. Like shit, man. A lot of people aren't willing to do that. So I think if you look at the timeline and have a very real conversation with yourself, like, am I willing to commit this time to building this business to this point, knowing that it's going to take way longer than, than you think it is. Mm -hmm. um, and if you think, if you think you have a timeline, ask yourself what metrics you're putting in place that make you for sure that it's going to be that timeline. Because sometimes it's true. Sometimes it's an accurate timeline and there are very real things that line up. Like, hey, we're going to build this and this person's looking for this and we're going to sell it at this point and here's the exit strategy. Sometimes that's, you know, a real scenario. Um, it's just very rare. Mm -hmm. Usually things take, you know, five to 10 times longer than you think they're going to. It ties into every other problem that people have, right? One of the comments I saw was, you know, how do you deal with uh, test days? Like, how do you deal with it when, like, one of those days when, like, everything you touch just turns to shit? I think it's important to understand nature of what you're walking into. Entrepreneurship is hard. It's not what you see on Instagram. Where people are like, oh, it's nice. I just created my LLC and now I make a million dollars. Check out my fucking Lamborghini. Like, it's not, it's not like that. And if somebody's, you know, showing you only the good stuff, then they're probably full of shit, you know? Because that's not what it looks like. I haven't seen anybody yet who just has a clear rise from like, you know, zero to a hundred. Like it, success does not look like that for, for anybody at any measure. So there are dips and valleys and there are, you know, it, it's a convoluted path. I wanted to do with this podcast was show people like, hey, it's not it's not what you think it is. You got to be fucking ready for it. And here's some, some steps and things will help you along the way. Uh, one of those, I think maybe the biggest thing is just knowing what you're getting into. It's like, if you want to be a pro fighter, you're going to get fucking hit. You know, like you can't go in and be like, I want to be a fighter and never get hit. And you're just going to win all your rounds by knockout. Like, Nobody does that. And everybody knows that. But somehow everybody thinks they're going to go into entrepreneurship. I'm like, I'm just going to KO everybody on the way up. I'm like, dude, that's life you're fighting. Like mm -hmm. life is going to fuck with you nonstop. You're going to have days where it lets you in and days where it just crushes you. And it's all a test, you know? Sometimes it, it's a test when you win. So you're like, how, how good of a winner are you? Yeah. Like, are you an asshole? Are you rubbing people's faces? Are you being a dick to people? Are you talking down to the wait staff on your celebratory dinner and busting people in the face with champagne like an asshole? Like that 
also tells life. And, you know, from my experience, when you do that, like, man, life's like, okay, this motherfucker's not ready to win. I got to crush him down a little bit more. Yeah. And then you get the lows, but that's just part of the game, man. And I mean, there's tactics and things you can use to, to get through it. But I think maybe the biggest thing is just to go into it with an understanding that that's the nature of the game that you're playing. And if you want to get into that game, you're going to get hit in the face mm. by, by life, by finances, by products, by manufacturing shortfalls and like <laughs> your customers, like everything is going to, is going to pile on. But I think it gives you power to go into it knowing that like, okay, I'm ready now. I'm ready for this. I'm ready for what's up. Yeah. 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 Sometimes, man, like the juice isn't worth the squeeze. We had one client, we helped them build this company from like 100,000 a year to like four and a half million over like three years. They ended up fucking us over for like 40 cents a shirt or some, some shit like that. Totally stabbed me in the back, like said one thing, did another, like, oh, bro, we got this. Oh, we're blah, blah, blah. We're homies, blah, blah. And it completely like, fucked me over. And um, we had a pallet of his custom bags and shit that we ordered for him. It's like 60,000 bags and like stickers and all this shit. And I'm like, hey man, like we'll send this to your new shop. It's But it's like five and a half thousand of the shit. It's my cost. I spent five and a half thousand dollars of this. And I showed him the invoices. So like, he, here's what I paid for it. But I just want you to pay the five and a half grand that I paid for this. If you're no longer going to work with us, pay this and I'll ship it to your new shop. Didn't do it, didn't do it, didn't do it. And finally, I'm like, look, motherfucker, you, we had a, a contract. So it wasn't a written contract. It was a verbal contract witnessed by other people, handshake deal, which actually holds up in court of law in Texas. If you didn't know, shout out to fucking, <laughs> shout out to legal knowledge. <laughs> um, so I told him, it's like, look, man, like if you don't pay this five and a half thousand dollars, I'm going to sue you for a quarter million dollars for breach of contract. Like, oh, what the fuck? This is not, I thought we were homies. I'm like, what? Yeah, if we were homies, number one, you wouldn't fuck me over. And number two, you'd understand that this is a very fair ask I'm, I'm asking for this and you wouldn't be a fucking cock about it. Yeah. So fuck that guy. I understand now why we're one of the only people I know of that even does this type of thing because it's so difficult and your margins are so fucking low. It's crazy. But I think through being fucked over so many times, we've made the line as clear as we can. It's like, we'll help out our clients as much as we can. We'll bend over backwards as, as much as we can to help a client, but we'll never bend over forwards. <laughs> <laughs> And that's, that's Touch kind of the line, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll bend over backwards, but never <laughs> forwards. And there you have it, episode 29. I wanted to make something for you guys still. Uh, never want to miss a week. We really appreciate having all of you guys. But there you go, episode 29 in the books. Episode 30, me and Ryan will be back in the studio. Appreciate all the love and support that you guys give. If you guys have any questions, let me and Ryan know. DM us. We'll answer them on the podcast. Appreciate you guys. And uh, like we always say, shake and bake.